5. Dr. J. R. Daniel Kirk on a Man Attested by God, Part 1. Dr. J. R. Daniel Kirk earned his Ph.D. in religion from Duke University. He's taught at Duke, North Carolina State, Biblical Seminary, Eastern University, St. Joseph's University, and Fuller Seminary. He currently serves as pastoral director at Newbingen House of Studies, and he blogs at storiedtheology.com. Dr. Kirk has published more than a dozen articles on biblical exegesis and is the author of the books Unlocking Romans, Resurrection and the Justification of God, and Jesus Have I Loved But Paul? A Narrative Approach to the Problem of Pauline Christianity. But he's here with us today to talk about his latest book, A Man Attested by God, The Human Jesus of the Synoptics. Dr. Kirk, welcome to the Trinity's Podcast. Thank you, Dale. It's a pleasure to be here. Dr. Kirk, congratulations on this important book. What was it that persuaded you that a lot of recent scholarship is off base when it comes to the human Jesus of the Synoptic Gospels? There were two things, really. One of them was simply my own reading strategy by which I came to make sense of the Synoptic Gospels. I grew up in a church context, in a moderate Southern Baptist church, and in that context, the content of faith was very much believe in Jesus, and specifically that Jesus is the divine Son of God and that Jesus died for our sins. What I found when I turned to Scripture was that that was a really great framework for reading the Gospel of John. The Gospel of John, I felt like, made sense to me because Jesus there was answering the kinds of questions that I was bringing with me. What I discovered, though, was that I didn't really know what to do with the stories in the Synoptic Gospels. They simply didn't work as I was trying to read them in that way. And through seminary and grad school, as I started to read them simply as statements about the arrival of Israel's Messiah, the stories gained a a new coherence and a life for me. One of the most important things that I'm responding to is simply the fact that I think that these stories are better stories and they make more sense when we read them as describing Jesus as this awesome, surprising Messiah figure than when we read them uh, as divine. The other angle of it is that when I started getting into some of the the scholarship on early high Christology, uh, especially Richard Balcom, uh, who I'm sure we'll talk about a little bit more He's been very influential in uh, people's understanding of how to look for a divine Christ in the New Testament. What I found was that his theoretical framework started with what I thought was the wrong question, and therefore he was giving the wrong answer. He was asking, you know, how did the Gospels come to say the things, that, or how did the Bible come to say the things that it does about Jesus? And then he looked at angels. The way that Judaism and Scripture depicts these heavenly intermediaries, that doesn't really get us near to where Jesus is because they don't rule the world on God's behalf, they don't sit on God's throne, they don't bear the divine name. Well, the thing that was patently obvious to me as I was reading it was that in the biblical story, it's not angels that are created to rule the world for God and bear the divine name, it's humanity. So I wanted to to step back and go, no, look, If we look at how the Old Testament and early Judaism talks about human figures, that's where we're going to find people who rule the world on God's behalf, will receive worship alongside God. These are the ones who will bear the divine name. I realized that there was a better framework for understanding what we were seeing, and that the conclusion about Christ being divine was being drawn because the Gospels were being interpreted in conversation with the wrong set of data. So uh, that was going on in the back of my head, and then I think it was really when I read Simon Gathercole's book, Arguing for Preexistence Christology in the Synoptic Gospels, that I realized, no, I, I need to write my book because this high Christology business is getting such significant traction, and I just don't think the arguments are sound. Dr. Kirk, you brought up Simon Gathercole and his book, The Preexistence Son. I read that book as well, and I kind of admired it, but I thought it was a really heroic attempt to get blood from a stone. I I just thought, man, there's nothing to work with here. It sounds like you were not convinced either. Is that accurate? It is. I mean, I think that the the most significant exegetical contribution that Gathercole attempts to make is the idea that the I have come sayings I have come plus the infinitive is a set phrase that is used by angelic or heavenly intermediaries who come on a mission from God. So when Jesus says, I have come, that is a signal that he's literally come from the presence of the Father as an angelic figure would have. 
I found that that argument ran aground in a couple of different places. One particular place where Jesus talks about, I've come, he compares and contrasts himself with John. He says, John came fasting, and but the Son of Man came eating and drinking. And you say, look, someone, a, a glutton and a, someone who has a demon. So Jesus uses that same language of having come, both of himself and of John the Baptist, And I think that opens us up to a better understanding of that phrase, which is that God sends prophets. You know, when God says to Isaiah, who will go for me? Here I am, send me. Prophets come with a message from God. And I think that that is a completely adequate and better uh, understanding of what Jesus is saying when he says, I've come. He's talking about the mission that's been given to him. Uh, And then there are a couple of ways that he picks up on Richard Balcom's criteria of receiving worship or bearing the divine name that he uses to say, you know, here's other indications of divinity. And as I've said, uh, I don't find those indications to be compelling. Dr. Kirk, let's hone in a little bit on your thesis. The way you put your thesis is that in the Synoptic Gospels, Jesus is presented as, quote, an idealized human figure. I wonder if we could also call this a divinely anointed human being, But in any case, how does this help us understand how a first century reader would have understood Matthew, Mark, and Luke? I think that the most important work that I do in this book is the lengthy Judaism chapter, where I survey different ways that people are depicted in the Jewish tradition. And I use the phrase idealized human figures to describe people of the past, present, or idealized future who have some special role in representing Israel before God or God before the world. So this could be Adam or representations of Adam. It could be prophets like Moses. It could be priests. It could be kings. So, you know, I don't use anointed in my description of these idealized human figures because not all of them fall into those anointed roles from Israel's story. Adam, for instance, is is greater. But let me just give you a a couple of pictures of why I, I think this is important. Let's just take Moses and the way that Moses is depicted. Moses, uh, when God calls him, God says, I'm going to make you God to Pharaoh. So Moses plays the part of God on earth in this story. Why is that important? Well, the argument from Balcom and those who have developed his work is that the way a Jewish writer would depict Jesus as divine would not be through Greek categories of ontology or substance or essence, but they would depict this person playing a role that Scripture reserves for God alone. It's only something that's true of God alone, and they depict Jesus doing it. That's their way of saying Jesus is divine. Well, what I want to say is, no, look, Moses here plays the role of God. That doesn't make him God. That makes him God's special agent. God later says to Moses, you know, Moses is like, I don't want to talk. And God says, fine, I'm going to let Aaron be your prophet and you will be God to Aaron and Aaron will be your prophet. So Moses stands in this place of God. When the, the Red Sea crossing happens, yes, God is the only one who has control over the wind and the seas, and it's Moses lifting up his staff and striking the water that causes the seas to part. As the story's told, it's this back and forth where both the actions of Moses and the actions of Yahweh together are enacting this great miracle, so that the upshot is that the people put their faith in God and in God's servant Moses. Both of them are the object of faith. In a later document, perhaps from Alexandria, the exagogue of Moses, Moses in this story has a dream. And in the dream, um, there's this old man sitting on a throne, and the old man on the throne vacates his throne, tells Moses to sit in it, gives Moses his scepter and his crown, and then the stars uh, of the heavens bow down before him. And the interpretation of this is that God is giving Moses God's own rule over the world. All right, so Richard Balcom says, only God can sit on God's throne, and anybody who's depicted sitting on God's throne is being depicted as divine. Well, is Moses being depicted as divine? Do you want to say that Moses is being depicted as divine in the same way that Jesus is later being depicted as divine? I don't think that's what Balcom wants to do. 
what we see is that there is this deep, deep reservoir in early Judaism of being able to describe Israel's own heroes as sharing in actions, ascriptions, or attributes of God that otherwise you would assume are reserved for God alone. Whether that's sharing in God's glory, whether that's bearing God's name, whether that's exercising God's own divine sovereignty over the earth. The upshot is that when we come to these stories, the Gospels, each in their own way, invite us to read the stories in conversation with the scriptures of Israel. And we have to assume that as Jewish people, they're part of a tradition of interpretation. The conversation I'm getting into is, what would a Jewish person mean by showing Jesus doing these things, bearing the divine name, having scripture that's originally about Yahweh applied to to him? What would all of this mean? And what the Judaism section demonstrates is that everything that is said about Jesus in the Synoptic Gospels has been said about other glorified, idealized human figures in the story of Israel. So the upshot is that when we read these, we see these as stories about the Messiah, about a surprising Messiah, about a Messiah who surprises us because of the amount of authority that he bears from God. Yes, who surprises us because despite bearing all of this authority from God, he still has to die. And a Messiah who is throughout a distinct character from God. It gets the stories wrong, or at least it's a misreading of the stories as they're given for us to start probing into a a divine identity per se for Jesus. When I initially encountered your phrase, idealized human figure, I reacted a little bit against the word idealized because it made me think that you meant sort of oversimplified or inaccurate. You know, if you talk about like an idealized biography of George Washington, maybe that doesn't quite properly represent him. But I guess hearing you explain it, you mean idealized more in the sense of um, sort of a uniquely or at least extraordinarily and surprisingly exalted place that this person is supposed to play in God's plan, something like that? Yes, exactly. An extraordinarily exalted place they play in the plan and an extraordinary depiction of how they do that. The perfection with which they do it, the the divine glory that they bear or come into, the surprising authority that they have to rule the world for God in Echo of Genesis 1. So yeah, that's what I'm getting at. Dr. Kirk, recently I listened to a podcast called The Mind Renewed. They were interviewing Dr. Michael Lycona, and I enjoy some of his work. I think he's good in the areas that he has concentrated on. And he says the following regarding the gospel according to Mark which I think encapsulates what's become a fairly widespread view recently. And I was wondering if we could get your response to it. When you look at the Gospel of Mark as a whole, contrary to what many skeptical scholars are saying, that Mark has the lowest Christology, Mark has the same Christology as the others. Once you recognize the biographical character of Mark's Gospel, it becomes rather easy to see. So it starts off by saying, um, hey, as Isaiah the prophet said, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight the paths of our God. Who's that applying to? Well, it's not Jesus who's the voice of one crying in the wilderness. It's John the Baptist that's talking about. And John the Baptist is preparing the way of the Lord. He's making straight the paths of God. Well, who's the Lord and God in this case? It's Jesus. So from the very get-go in chapter 1, it's pointing to the divinity of Jesus. You go to chapter 2, you've got Jesus who forgives the sins of a paralytic, gives him the ability to walk, and they say, hey, that's blasphemy, only God can forgive sins. Hmm. Yep. And you got the same kind of progression through many of the chapters, chapters 3, chapters 4, chapter 9, chapter uh, 14, and, and so forth, where Jesus is seen, and he does these things, walks on water, coming on the clouds of heaven. These are things that the Old Testament scriptures say only God can do. Mark is clearly presenting Jesus as divine. So within the biographical character of Mark, he's presenting the divine nature of Jesus. The argument that he's making has become a very common standard argument. I think that there is a hint of it, at least, in, uh, in Ricky Watts's book, Isaiah's New Exodus and Mark. 
And Richard Hayes has been promoting this reading of Mark 1 as well in his new book, Reading Backwards, that came out last year, and then Echoes of Scripture and the Gospels, which came out this year. So, yeah, it is a, a very common reading. I would say that it is a, a misreading of the introduction of Mark as well. Okay, so the beginning of Mark is, first of all, it's not just a citation of Isaiah. It's a conflated citation from Isaiah, but also from Malachi 3 and probably Exodus 23. The interesting thing about that is that there are opportunities from those passages to make this a first-person reference to God arriving. And instead, the divine voice speaks in the first person about somebody else whose way is being prepared. So, to start, Behold, I'm sending my messenger before your face who will prepare your way. There is a very similar, almost identical phrase in Malachi 3, where God says, I'm going to send the messenger before me, before my face, prepare the way before me. Instead, there is the second person singular. I'm going to send someone before your face. So there is the divine voice who is speaking to someone else about the way of being prepared. It may be that this is drawing on Exodus 23, where the idea is that there's an angel or a messenger that's going to go before the people into the land. But either way, we have three persons who are in view here. Yes, the one whose voice is crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. That is, of course, John the Baptist. So that's the one that God sends. Um, Prepare the way of the Lord. Yes, it's the Lord Jesus. And of course, the Lord Jesus is representing God. But then the end, make straight not my paths and not the paths of our God, but make straight his paths. Hmm. So uh, again, there's an opportunity where if Mark had simply quoted the text as it's written, prepare the way for our God, then there could be a very strong signal that Jesus is, in fact, the divine agent here that Isaiah 40 is talking about. Instead, there is God saying that this other person is going to prepare the way for a third person who is going to be Jesus. This holds Jesus and God in tight connection in that Jesus is the agent of God, and Jesus is the fulfillment of this Isianic promise, and I would say even what it looks like for God to show up on the scene is for God's anointed agent Jesus to be here. So this is the manifestation of the divine presence that Isaiah was hoping for. But the idea that Jesus is personally God is, uh, I think, carefully avoided by Mark in this text. He mentioned a couple other things. I'll just go through them quickly. One was the idea that Jesus forgiving sins is a manifestation of his deity. They say, you know, who is this who can forgive sins? No one can forgive sins but God alone. First of all, we're reading a story, and we need to remember that what the bad guys say in the story is typically not good guidance for, uh, for our reading. Uh, Preach it. And so so those are the bad guys, so we need to be yeah. very careful about saying, yeah, they've got it right. Yeah. The other thing to say, though, is that when Jesus defends himself, what he says is, so that you might know that the son of man, the son of humanity, the human one, has authority on earth to forgive sins. I say to you, rise, take up your mat, and go home. The Christological key to this text is not the accusation against Jesus that he's God alone. The Christological key is his claim to be the son of man who has been given authority upon the earth to forgive sins. Now, this gets into the huge question of what is the son of man Christology in Mark's gospel and in the gospels. Uh, I argue extensively in my book. I make a really, really long argument that son of man does mean what it meant in both Hebrew and Greek, which is the human being. And it's an allusion to Daniel 7, in which the Son of Man is a figure representing Israel, a collective group of human beings. So Jesus is claiming for himself the authority that God grants to Israel when Israel is victorious over the enemies of God's people. So uh, I think there's that going on. His claim to have authority upon the earth. Morna Hooker has argued that this might be an echo of Genesis 1 with its recurring language of epites gaze upon the earth in its description of creation, but specifically 
It's the realm over which God gives humanity authority in Genesis 1. Let's create humanity in our own image and our own likeness and let them rule upon the earth. Apites geis in the Greek there as well. So the idea that this is Jesus reclaiming humanity's primal right to exercise God's own authority upon the earth makes for a better reading of this text and the Christological clues that Jesus gives. Yes, only God can forgive sins, that's right, which means that God gets to decide which humans can forgive sins on God's behalf. The other thing that I would just say in in passing is that before you go absolutizing the idea that only God can forgive sins, therefore Jesus is God because he can do it, make sure that you are ready to carry that logic with you to the end of John's gospel when Jesus says to the disciples, receive the Holy Spirit, anyone whose sins you forgive are forgiven, anyone's Mm -hmm. sins you hold are withheld. Yep. One of the measures that I keep coming back to in my book is this question, does Jesus give authority for something that he does to another human being? If so, then that act of authority is no indication of inherent divinity. I'm cherry-picking into the Gospel of John there, but I think it's important for us to recognize that in early Christianity, there was this recognition that forgiving sins was not strictly a divine purview. It's a divine purview. Therefore, people to whom God gives that authority can do it as well. Yeah, I have to say, I found those parts of the book that you just mentioned, the discussion of Daniel 7 and the discussion of the interesting editing that's gone on in the quotations in Mark 1, I found those parts very convincing. A lot of good, hardcore uh, exegesis there. A couple years ago, I wrote a blog post about this very subject, about whether Jesus is God and the gospel according to Mark. And when you read the book as a whole, which is easy to do in one sitting, in the case of Mark, the author just hammers you over the head with his thesis. And you make the point in your book very well that the message at the beginning, the middle, and the end is that he is God's Messiah. And in contrast, we're being offered this reading where it's almost like you need a secret decoder ring. The author, he tells you one thing, but what he really means is this other thing that he's constantly sort of throwing out these little hints. And there's something jarring about that. I mean, these books were read in Christian assemblies You're not supposed to have to be a sophisticate to understand the message of them. Uh, I think I got this from James McGrath. You know, one thing that he pointed out, which in hindsight is obvious, is that if there's a divine Christology, it's asking us to see and believe something about Jesus that neither the narrator, nor Jesus as a character in the story, nor any other character in the story articulates or thinks. Right. I do think that from you know, the literary perspective, that that is problematic. If you're going to say these things are just obvious implications of the text, then I would expect to find ancient readers like Origen and Tertullian seeing this quotation from Isaiah in Mark chapter 1 and saying, oh, this is God himself. That's not what they say. They draw a strong distinction between the one God and his son. Dr. Kirk, throughout the book, you distinguish the idea of identifying Jesus with God from identifying Jesus as God, would it be accurate to restate these respectively as associating Jesus and God together versus saying that Jesus just is God himself? Yeah, I think so. One of my challenges with the work of Richard Balcom is that I actually really like the phrase divine identity Christology because I actually think that Jesus is regularly being identified with God, that to see Jesus is to see the work of God here. And so it's a way to try to say that this kind of representation that we're talking about, it's as high a Christology as is humanly possible, as uh, Michael Pepper uh, describes the, the Christology of Mark. So, yeah, it's representation, it's association, and I think this is really the challenge, is to be able to pin down what exactly is the nature of the association between Jesus and God. I find that some of the the high Christology work, I find the terminology to be slippery. Balcom seems to be very careful to not say that he identifies Jesus as God. He's he's always saying he's identifying Jesus with God. Fortunately, Richard Hayes recently has just come out and started saying it, uh, which I think has been the implication all along, that this you know, divine identity Christology means that Jesus is being identified as God, that Jesus is, in some mysterious way, the God of Israel. Several points in the book, you are talking about various authors, and you describe the author as realizing that identifying Jesus as God is just going too far. 
So right. the author will sort of just stop just short of it to let the reader conclude it. Right. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and this is actually part of... Think about this, that, though. I, I think that is a, a critical problem with the early high Christology movement, is that the really good and careful scholars who are setting it all up always seem to back off just at the last minute or, you know, carefully couch their language. But then the people who come behind and read them draw what I think is the obvious conclusion but then, you know, the folks who have gotten in there can can say, no, 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 that's a misrepresentation. I never would say it quite like that. You know, what would it even mean to say, you know, Jesus is the God of Israel? I don't know, but that's what <laughs> that's what it seems like this book is trying to get people to conclude. You know, whether it's Balcom or, you know, I hate to drag Larry Hurtado into it, but I think there are times when he also, you know, he'll say, look, worship is this cavern, <laughs> you know, the, between God and anyone else. Mm -hmm. And at a shockingly early point, Christians included Jesus in this thing, which it can only be true of God himself. So we might call this, uh, you know, an early, you know, it's a Benetarian pattern of worship. So you're saying Jesus is God. No! What is Benetarian supposed to connote if not that you're two-thirds of the way toward the Trinity? I can't imagine it using that language to mean something else, even though he wants to. I think he's made clear that he doesn't use Benetarian to describe the theology of the New Testament, but it's, he calls it the pattern of worship as Benetarian, right. which just means that it has two objects. Which in early Judaism could only be one. Yeah. But your point about how does the author relate Jesus and God, uh, in what way does he associate the one with the other, or as you say, identify the one with the other? I mean, in Mark, it's right in the 11th verse, you are my son, whom I love, with you I am well pleased. And it's abundantly clear that he's a man, so he's somebody else, he's the son of God, he's a real man. That's going pretty far. Yeah. You know, I want to say also that to read this as Jesus being an idealized human figure, I think it does two things. One, as we've been talking about, I think it respects the story that Mark actually wrote. At the beginning, middle, and end, Jesus is identified as Son of God. I argue in my book that the baptism is simultaneously an anointing for Jesus to kingship and an anticipation of his coming death. I will leave you to go read the chapter and see how that plays out. In the middle, God's voice comes in again. This is my beloved son. Listen to him, to the disciples who had just denied the idea that the Christ had to suffer and die. So there, again, I think the idea of sonship having to do with being the king, but also with the surprising bit that he's going to have to die. And then on the cross, right, he dies on the cross with the king of Israel thing over his head, and the centurion says, surely this man was a son of God. So mm -hmm. you've got kingship and death at each of those places, and that, to me, is the, is the core of the book. You know, the other thing to say about it is that if you just accept the idea that Jesus is not divine in this telling of the Jesus story, or that that's not a concern uh, of the gospel, then you don't have the problems that Christian theology has with the story. I'm thinking specifically about the garden, uh, where Jesus is pleading for the cup to be taken away from him. But more pointedly, the cross, when Jesus cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why have you abandoned me? However you parse the identity of Jesus in Matthew and in Mark, Jesus and God have to be separate enough characters for the Jesus who's hanging on the cross to be abandoned by the God he's served throughout the story. Now, there is a theology afoot, or a family of theologies, which uh, this is discussed in theology, but also by Christian philosophers, that have separate characters that could have a relationship, could talk with one another, one could ask the other one to be excused from something terrible. But that's the social Trinitarian scheme. Basically, on that theology, there are three divine beings. Does that fit with Mark, in your view? Um, it just seems overly sophisticated for the depiction of Jesus that we have and Jesus and God that we have. I mean, I think it's a great way for Trinitarians to wrestle with these tensions um, between the, the Father and the Son in the text. But I think it's importing a, a theological category that's not native to it. Now, I'll also say this, that I am, generally speaking, a, a proponent of multiple readings of texts. I think that when Christians read the Old Testament, we should try to understand it as you know people in its original context would have heard it. And then I think we need to also then reread it in light of what we know and believe to be true about the life and teaching and death and resurrection of Jesus. 
Uh, and I think maybe we need to reread it again in light of just being 21st century people in different social locations. And so, you know, I'm actually not opposed to doing multiple readings of the Gospels where we, we listen to them first as stories about Jesus as an idealized human being. Uh, and then we come back and say, yes, and we are also Trinitarians. And so we're going to enrich our reading in these ways. We're going to exploit um, ambiguities in some of these other ways, and we see an added layer of meaning that was not accessible to the the first readers. So, you know, I think that there is some profundity uh, to that that can be had in, in giving such readings of the text. I just think that we have to be honest that we are bringing what I might call a Trinitarian revisionism with us to the text and not simply reading off the page what Mark has encoded there for us to decode with our, um, with our magic rings. I wondered about this reading the book. You made it abundantly clear at several places that your aim in this book is not so much to start a theological fight, but to have an exegetical argument about what the right reading of these is according to the historical critical method. And at one point, I think it was in a big footnote, you said something about, well, if we want to reappropriate this this later, fine, we can do that, bringing in later Trinitarian ideas and things like that. I mean, theologically, do you believe in sort of a teaching magisterium of the church that can come along and say, well, actually, we say it means this. And so, for instance, they might say, uh, you know, Jesus is able to heal in Mark because he has a divine nature. We'll tell you what it means. That's what it means. That's the normative meaning for Christians. Whatever it might have meant in the first century is another matter. I mean, does your theology allow for that kind of authority to post-apostolic tradition? No, I guess. Whenever you start talking about a teaching magisterium, I get very, very nervous. Um, I mean, I I think in part because I'm a biblical scholar. I mean, the whole reason biblical scholarship exists is because I think people were going, you know, I don't think that this text actually says what the church says it says. Actually, mm. I guess that starts with the Reformation, doesn't it? Uh, yeah, I'm just deeply reformed in that way, where the idea that an official church office would come and say this is what it means uh, is not something that I have a category for. I guess, and on that particular question, you know, I would say, gosh, so Jesus can do that healing because he's divine. All right, so what about the prophets that came before him? What about Elijah and Elisha? What about Paul and Peter? Clearly, healing can be a a derivative power as well. I would want to say, hey, let's first acknowledge that, yes, healing power means that the creator and restorer God is at work. And this God is often and usually at work through other people. And there are places where, for instance, in John's gospel, perhaps healing has more of a invites us to explore the character of Jesus in his preexistence, a glory that is being carried about on earth from a, from a heavenly home. But generally speaking, I would prefer to go with Peter and say Jesus was a human attested by God through signs and wonders and miracles. Once you said it like you said it, I feel this this deep urge to defend the human Jesus as the one who can heal, in part because there are other human healers and healing is part of what's entrusted to the disciples. And yet, uh, I think that there's also a place alongside that to say, and in other ways of articulating the story of Jesus, it's possible to read the healings as disclosure of a different sort of divine identity. Dr. Kirk, thanks for talking with us. It's been great to be here. Thanks so much. I've uh, enjoyed your, your insightful questions and the opportunity to talk about my work.